Hello, followers. This story belongs to the shared universe of the Professor Egghead stories. Link to both where to begin and a compilation of the series will be linked in the description, as well as pinned in the comments section. Thank you for listening, as always, and let's delve into the dark together. After 30 minutes of listening to the man's charcoal-scented rambles, my notepad was sparse with information. Oven. Gasoline. The Egghead. The burnt man's frenzied babbles didn't give me that much to go in terms of how the fire actually started, but there wasn't any doubt over who was responsible for it. Jason Blomquist was rushed into the emergency care with third-degree burns before the blaze in his living room had gone out. He had no prior convictions, but his father, a certain Alfred Blomquist, had spent the past two decades in a psychiatric ward up north for trying to paint his family home with gasoline. I have served in the arson department for long enough to know that the need to start fires usually singes through the family tree. Blomquist was thoroughly burnt and handcuffed in his hospital bed. His ravings didn't shed any light on the actual mechanics of the blaze, but they would serve as an easy home run for any prosecutor straight out of law school. I thanked Blomquist for his time and made my way through the sickly-smelling hallways to the parking lot. Beyond the shelter of the hospital, it was storming. It was the type of downpour that could slow down, perhaps even put out, a barn fire. For a couple minutes, I stood under the plastic roof and eyed the quickest route over to my car. As I made my calculations, an old man in a bathrobe and a walker made his way out of the hospital. The old guy looked frail enough to have seen the steam engine get invented, but he dragged his walker with a sort of regal authority. He shuffled his way over to the no-smoking sign, defiantly glancing at it, and then produced a crumpled-up cigarillo out of his bathrobe. I took out a cigarette and joined the old-timer for some idle chatter. His cigarillo reeked with a horrible mix of vanilla and burnt hospital food. When he shuffled his way back inside of the hospital, I told him I'd see him around. Not likely. He rasped just before the doors slid shut. The sprint to my car left me soaked and out of breath. Finding a steady drip of water on the case files I left on the seat didn't make me feel any better. I dug some scotch tape out of the glove box and added to the collage of black X's on my car's roof. The rain had turned my notes into inky hieroglyphs, but the rest of the pages managed to stay intact. I had a nip, lit up another cigarette, and tried to remember what I had thought worthy of writing down. It was the sort of arson case that made an argument for a merciful god with a cruel sense of humor. Jason Blomquist, age 35, recently divorced, has his son, Kenny Blomquist, age 6, over for the weekend. In the middle of the night, following his pop's footsteps, Jason sets a fire on the ground floor. Jason manages to get himself pretty burnt up, and the blaze consumes most of the living room by the time the troops contain it, but the house stays stable, and the second floor is completely untouched. The upstairs bedrooms aren't even singed, and what's more, little Kenny is found sleeping in his bed, completely unaware of anything happening. There was an interview transcript with the kid in my morning notes. He didn't seem to be completely aware of what had happened, but when pressed on his father's behavior, he said his pops was angry at him the evening before the blaze. Apparently, little Kenny had watched something on his iPad that he shouldn't have, and that set his dad off. Combined with Jason Blomquist's strange ramblings in the hospital, the case seemed pretty clear. Blomquist lost his marbles and decided to set his house on fire. Now, my job was to figure out how he set his house on fire. I had another nip and thought about a Blomquist's kid for a bit. Another cigarette did not make the rain slow down, and water started dripping back down on my passenger seat. I emptied my ashtray out of the window and rode off to the station for the mutt. She was smart, if you're the sort of person who considers dogs capable of intelligence. Marilyn was a bright-eyed golden lab one year into her five-year service. I've been on the force for a while. She was my fourth canine. I knew not to get too attached. These dogs are destined to solve crime till their senses dull and they retire to become someone's fun rescue dinner fact. Only takes them a couple years to forget their handler. 
She managed to get paw marks all over my notes when she got in the car, but the fact that they were barely legible calmed my nerves somewhat. Once Marilyn had managed to get herself comfortable, she opened her mouth and excitedly panted at the world outside. It was as if the freezing downpour beyond the windshield didn't exist for her. That mutt could retain her excitement in a meteor shower. My windshield wipers struggled on the freeway, and the inside of my car was getting unmanageably wet. Yet, by the time we hit the repeating spiderweb of cul-de-sacs, the sun sheepishly peeked out from the sky. Marilyn shoved her nose through my cracked window and huffed at the outside air. She was better at getting me to the crime scene than my busted GPS. I don't like suburbia. There's no personality in those homeowner association dictated houses. You can see life flowing through city streets. There's character in the offbeat storefronts and the clumps of people who hang around them. People live in the city. The suburbs is just a place where people come to sleep, and if the market isn't crashing, to save up enough cash to escape somewhere tropical. The suburbs are also the place where my canines retire. When we climbed out of the car, a woman with a helmet-like haircut noticed us. She insisted on letting her snotty child pet Marilyn. When I told her that the mutt was working and shouldn't be bothered, the helmet-headed mother grew disproportionately angry and started recording me on her phone. As me and Marilyn entered the crime scene, I could hear the crazy woman yelling something about civil service as her child wept in confusion. The troops were quick to contain the fire, but with suburban property prices this high, they usually are. The city's second finest had managed to contain the blaze halfway through the living room. A half-melted iPad with a screen smashed in delineated the exact extent of the fire. Everything beyond it, reaching out towards the kitchen, was charred history. The house had been cleared out early in the morning, but the hallway still seemed warm. Any hint of fresh rain and manicured lawns crept away, and the air was replaced by the familiar stench of work. Marilyn stopped panting and lowered her snout. She breathed in that symphony of smells her ancestors were bred for, took a couple more sniffs for safety, and then sat down. She looked up at me like a hungry red-light window model. Marilyn was loose for treats. They all are. If you're holding something to eat, you're any dog's best friend. If your hands are empty, you're about as interesting as the next person who walks by holding a burger. Affection doesn't come for free, and neither does arson investigation. I reached into the treat bag and pulled out a grease-smelling cookie shaped like a cartoon bone. She ate her reward in one bite and immediately proceeded to work for another one. Marilyn huffed in the fumes from the black floor and dragged me down the burnt-out hallway. By the time we were in the kitchen, I didn't need an arson dog to show me where the fire started. I smelled it myself. I sat. Could have solved this one on my own. But I still gave her a treat. The kitchen had the obvious wear and tear of a house fire, but the oven seemed to have come out of a wholly different disaster. The metal was bent and jagged, clearly pointing towards an explosion. Blomquist had shoved something covered in accelerant into the oven and decided to cook it. Case solved. I asked. Anything else of note, Marilyn? She studied my face for a moment, as if I were speaking an alien language. Then her big brown eyes jumped down to the treat bag. She stared at the food like a jonesing drunk, and then sniffed at the air. With a tug of the leash, she let me know that her nose might pick up another trail, granted that I had the grub to back it up. Marilyn led me to the garage. Even before the fire, Blomquist's car must have driven circles around his property value. The ride was new and screamed midlife crisis. Off in the corner sat a bunch of workout equipment still in its box. Marilyn sniffed it without much enthusiasm. She wasn't interested in how Jason Blomquist was dealing with his divorce. She was interested in the dusty shelf on the far side of the garage. Most of the space was taken up by unused tools and electronics that were too useless to keep, but too expensive to throw away. Yet among the forgotten items, there was something bright and baby blue. A bowl. I pointed at the bowl. You want me to look at this? Marilyn's jowls grew wet. I fed her a treat that was shaped like a hydrant. The bowl was covered with what seemed to be old tablecloth. For a second, I thought that the mutt had led me to Blomquist's experiments with self-rising dough, but the moment I removed the covering, I knew she found another lead. 
The bowl smelled like a gas station in the sticks. Inside of the bowl sat an egg-shaped mess of ground beef and flour. The egghead, I thought. I disregarded most of Jason Blomquist's hospital bed ravings as actual insanity, or at least a precursor for an insanity plea. In between the sips of water that the nurse administered, Blomquist kept on rasping about having to create the egghead and doing it all for science. It all seemed like gibberish at the time, but looking down at the egg-shaped sculpture, I wished I had recorded my interview. The craftsmanship of the egg was bizarre. Its body was rough and covered in loose chunks and strands of meat. The eyes of the figure were nothing but deep thumb indentations, yet the stubby limbs of the egg head looked as if they were made out of marble. Each finger existed in its own grayish, reddish right. The bottom of the shoes were flat enough to stand on. As I examined the hunk of gasoline-soaked meat, I noticed that the teeth of the egg head were also threateningly detailed. I had a nip, and then I draped the cloth back over the baby blue bowl. The smell of accelerants was making my head throb, so I cracked open the back door to let in some air. Beyond the door there was a fence, and beyond that fence there was a gravel path towards a nature trail. A gentle drizzle returns, but it was muffled under the bubbling of a nearby stream. The fresh air had cleared my head, but my lungs weren't satisfied with inhaling the smell of fresh-cut grass. I knocked a cigarette out of the pack and almost put it in my mouth before I realized where I was. I forced the smoke back into its box and elected to take the plastic bowl back to the station. While I managed to control my urges, however, the mutts did not. The wheeze escaped my lips before I had a chance to properly grip the leash. Shit. By the time my lips pursed for the SH, Marilyn was sprinting through the backyard. She jumped the fence with the ease of a track horse and slammed her front paws on a tree. Up in the branches, with its fur slick with rain, sat a hyperventilating squirrel. Marilyn's sole purpose of existence boiled down to terrifying the tiny creature. I called. I wiggled the bag of treats. I called again. Nothing helped. The only thing these mutts liked more than food is chasing vermin. I walked out of the garage, lit up a cigarette, and made my way across the fence in as dignified a manner as I could. By the time I got to the tree, Marilyn's hunter instincts had evaporated, and all that was left was shame. She kept her head low and stared up at me with a guilt that revealed the whites of her eyes. It's alright. We all have demons to fight, I said, and then grabbed the leash. I wanted to get out of the rain and back to the station. Whatever I had witnessed in the garage would be easier to process after a cup of coffee. I tugged, but she didn't move. Marilyn was too busy sniffing the air. I tried puffing on my soaked cigarettes, but came up smokeless. I stubbed out the fag in the gravel and pulled on the leash again. Come on, Marilyn. Let's get you back to the station. Marilyn didn't want to go to the station. She kept her nose to the gravel. Then she pulled. I took out a treat to see whether she was serious, but Marilyn didn't bat an eye. She pulled again. She was on a trail. She led me towards the bubbling of the stream to an old wooden bridge. Walking through the nature trail, I found myself worrying that Marilyn had simply caught the scent of another squirrel, but the moment I saw the bridge, I knew she had something. Pressed into the aging wood, there were footsteps. Burnt black into the bridge, as if made by small, perfectly spherical shoes, there were footsteps. The egghead, I thought. My hand reflexively brushed up against my holster. I didn't know what to point my gun at. I just wanted to make sure it was there. I felt way in over my head. Past the bridge, the waddling footsteps disappeared into a muddy path. When the black tracks disappeared, Marilyn slowed down, but she still had a direction. As we stomped through the mud, though, her pull lessened. Whatever tracks she had been following had grown faint. Marilyn was still after something, but her steps lost their confidence. Not knowing what to make of the situation, I let the mud drag me around while I figured out what to do. The wind had picked up and brought the rain down in gentle waves. I let the droplets wash over my tired face and tried to clear my mind by listening to the stream. At first, my thoughts kept on drifting to that chunk of sculpted meat soaked in gasoline. But with some calm breaths and a quick nip, I managed to get my head screwed on straight. 
I listened to the bubbling stream and Marilyn's sniffing and the falling rain and the far-off traffic and the strange hissing sound. The strange hissing sound, like someone throwing water on a hot stove. It came from beneath the old bridge. By the time I was certain of the strange sound, Marilyn had completely lost the trail. I gave her another bone-shaped cookie for good effort and then beckoned her towards the bridge. She sniffed at the air again, caught something beyond my comprehension, and took the lead herself. With each gust of rain, the hissing sound grew louder. As Marilyn dragged me off the dirt path, I started to hear something else. Beneath the strange hiss, a voice lingered and babbled in a gentle falsetto. Marilyn growled. She saw him before I did. When my eyes finally came across the egg-shaped creature, I mumbled a prayer and drew my gun. His body was of graying flesh, not unlike the egghead I found in the garage. Each droplet that hit the creature's meaty body, however, turns to steam. Wherever the rain hit, the flesh simmered up with foamy white and left a mark. The creature sat beneath the bridge, but the wind was strong enough to curve the droplets. The creature didn't seem to mind. He just babbled to himself with his sharp little teeth. He just babbled to himself and watched me. Unlike the work in progress I found in the garage, this egghead had eyes. Big red hot coals rested in the creature's sockets. The egghead's gaze sizzled as it noticed me. He stopped babbling. He stopped babbling and got up and waddled his way towards me. I dropped the leash and grabbed the gun proper and yelled at the egg to stop moving. He didn't listen. Instead, the creature raised his stubby arms towards me. He smelled like sulfur. He smelled like sulfur and those short, fat fingers were stretched out towards me. Like marble worms slathered in grease, the egghead's fingers slid towards me. One bark from my pistol made them retreat. I blew a hole in him. I blew a hole right down his forehead, and he fell over. An overpowering stench of rotten eggs took control of the air. The thing was oozing a yolky, greenish fluid out of its wound. One of the egghead's fiery eyes, being dislodged by my bullet, lay a stone's throw away from the corpse. When the viscous green liquid reached the hot coal, it coagulated into what looked like scrambled eggs. No, Marilyn, there's nothing good there for you. I barely got a hold of the leash to keep her from investigating. She refused any verbal orders to sit. It wasn't until I threw her a treat that I got her attention. Needing some space, I slipped the leash off and threw a handful of biscuits into the grass. Marilyn quickly occupied herself hunting. My hands were shaking. I instinctively reached into my jacket for a nip, but I realized the possible problems with having alcohol on my breath while trying to explain this Eggman. I lit up a cigarette and picked up my phone instead. Calling the station seemed like the most reasonable thing to do. Somebody else needed to see what I was seeing. As the phone rang, I started to worry whether I wasn't getting myself sent to an asylum for telling the chief what I saw. But then, a wholly different concern occupied my thoughts. The babbling. The egghead was babbling again. Before I even reached for my gun, the terrible thing was back on its feet. Before I even managed to aim, it had me down in the mud. The egghead didn't waddle this time. He instead launched himself with shocking force straight into my solar plexus. The creature was the size of a football, but it packed the punch of artillery fire. I felt my ribs crack. My breath left my lungs like a stampede at a theater fire. The egghead straddled my chest with such weight that my panicked heart strained. The creature's right eye socket had been reduced to a circle of what looked like burnt meat and pus, but its left eye burnt with fiery rage. The babbling had gotten louder and sterner, as if the small egghead was to teach me a lesson. His stubby fingers turned long once more. With a strange gentleness, they slithered down into my collarbone. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't breathe, and the egghead was tickling me. At first, the eggshell-covered fingers simply grazed against my neck, but soon enough, 
the strange sensation turned painful. The thin fingers were growing increasingly hot. I could smell my stubble being singed. With my lungs compressed and hot irons at my vocal cords, I couldn't manage anything but a yelp. A yelp, luckily, was all the girl needed. With a growl I'd never heard before, Marilyn knocked the egghead off of my chest. She barked at the tumbling creature with the intensity of a shotgun and then leapt at it once more. Marilyn's second contact with the creature, however, was met with a sharp whimper. She sunk her teeth into the creature, but immediately let go. A puff of smoke came out of the dog's mouth, and the oval creature went crashing into the stream. The egghead met the water with the sputter of a sauna rock. The water was starting to turn muddy with the rain, but I could see the creature clearly. Its flesh had turned the pale white of an eggshell, and the coal eye sprung bubbles like a hangover tablet. But the thing was still alive. I stopped at the monster. I stopped at the eggshell until all that was left was coagulated clumps of greenish goop flowing down the stream. I made sure the egghead had been taken care of, and then I climbed out of the water to check up on the dog. She wasn't doing well. I didn't leave anything out of the report. The manila envelope I dropped at the chief's desk had the look of an overzealous sandwich. I described the egghead in detail. I included sketches and theories and even some photographs of what remained of the terror before the spring carried it away. It didn't do any help. The rest of the station was reluctant to believe what I had to say, but I was given some leeway to focus on the Blomquist fire investigation. A second interview with the burnt man didn't reveal anything new. All Jason Blomquist did was nonchalantly blabber about the egghead again and speak about the importance of science. After a train ride up north, I managed to flag down Blomquist's ex-wife for a coffee, but that conversation was fruitless as well. Aside from the couple mentions of his father's internment, Jason Blomquist never spoke about arson, let alone showing any tendency towards it. I wanted to sit down with the kid, Kenny, to see if he could shed any light on the fire, but his mother refused to let me interview him. I could have nudged someone at the station to make the interview mandatory, but I didn't. Forcing the kid to talk to me wouldn't make the nightmares of the egg-shaped creature disappear. It wouldn't bring Marilyn's sense of smell back. For a while, I fought with the idea, but eventually, I let all thoughts of the egghead die in that muddy stream of cracked shell. She could burn to her front gums and would have to be careful about solid food for the rest of her life, but it was her nose that was given a death sentence. Marilyn's sense of smell would never come back. The vet had figured it out within a couple minutes of the visit. In an effort to save me from the insane creature, the mutt had rendered herself unemployed. I couldn't adopt her. Arson dogs don't belong into cramped city apartments. What I did manage to do, however, was pull some strings and shoot down some adoption requests. After calling in a couple favors with the pen pushers, Marilyn managed to get adopted by my nephew out east. I have to drive half the country to get to her, but after the winter holidays, once all the fireworks have been set off and it's too cold for the forest fires, I see her. I see her as she remembers me.